Hello, everybody. Hi. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us uh, to have this important conversation. We are going to have a conversation, to be clear. Uh, we have all agreed that we're not going to do long presentations. I'll explain how this conversation is going to go in just a minute. But we're here to talk about disinformation, amplification, and intimidation online, focusing on the news media. I think that it's important for us to be aware of the impact that these uh, actions take on journalists, on journalism, on our communities, and on democracy in general. With the explosion of the label fake news, intimidation tactics that discredit journalists or attempt to discredit journalists, and certainly have the impact of silencing them, it's important for us not only to be aware of what the implications of these actions are, but also to focus on solutions. So um, I wanted to raise, uh, there's been some research on, specifically on the impact of these actions against journalists. The IWMF, the International Women's Media Foundation, my organization that I lead, I'm Elisa Lise Munoz, I'm the executive director of the International Women's Media Foundation. We just published a report indicating that uh, for US-based journalists, 70% of female journalists experience online harassment and uh, the impact of this happens nearly every day and it is driving female journalists out of the news profession. Certainly it's driving male journalists out of the profession as well. It also leads to uh, consequences that may very much reflect what uh, physical intimidation and harassment look like. So I think it's really important that we use language that's appropriate and that we don't um, just call it harassment. These are attacks and they have very serious implications. Um, I just want to quote from the Huffington Post and it said, the descent from disagreement to rebuttal to vile abuse is swift and in many cases it doesn't even go through any intervening stages. It's outright hate speech from the start and it gets worse if it targets attacks happen to be a woman or minority communities and I would add or journalists. So with that I want to go ahead and introduce our distinguished panelists who will be joining us in this conversation. Um, we're going to spend 30 minutes talking about our perceived uh, concerns around this problem. We're going to open it up to the audience to intervene as well, and then we'll move on to solutions. And I want to be very strict not to just focus on the concerns and to move on to solutions rather quickly. So I will start by introducing our guest. This is Swati Chaturvedi on my left. She's an award-winning print and broadcast journalist. She has worked for The Statesman, The Indian Express, Hidutsu Times, Hindustan Times, pardon me, and Z News. Uh, she has written several books, and her latest book uh, is about uh, her own experience as the target of state-sponsored trolls um, because of her work as a journalist. Following her is Joy Watagi Ningundu. She is the vice president and co-founder of Digital Grassroots, and she is also the lead coordinator for the East Africa Youth Internet Governance Forum. She is a lawyer by profession, and she is working with youth in Nairobi and around Africa to in better inform them about internet policies and how they are impacted by them. Um, and last. I'm sorry, then I'm going to move on to Amy Awad. She is the Manager of Legislative and Regulatory Policy, Broadcasting and Digital Communications at Canadian Heritage. Uh, she works for the Canadian government and she's going to be focusing on their uh, response to the uh, misinformation online and uh, attempts to address it. And last but not least, we have Christophe Del Delore. He is the Secretary General of Reporters Without Borders, uh, Reporters Sans Frontières here in France. And he has, and his organization have done an incredible amount of work and currently focusing on the impact of online attacks and harassment against journalists and more importantly, or as importantly, on solutions. So uh, we're going to open with Christophe and then we're going to go to each panelist and ask them to speak about their two key concerns on this issue, and then we will open it up to you all. So, Christophe, please. 
Thank you so much for this introduction. So you asked us um, to deal with two problems. I will deal with two key problems, according to us, that are two problems of unfair competition. It could be a, a surprise that we deal with unfair competition regarding the topics we have to discuss today. But in fact, what happens in the information and communication space is that there are distortions of competition that are really dangerous. The first one is unfair competition between verify, uh, verified toler tolerant contents and, on the other side, eight lies, what some people call fake news. Why is there an unfair competition on this? Because some rules were lost. You know that some studies from the MIT, for instance, make obvious that the false information has a potential virality, virality that is six times higher than verified facts. So nowadays, those who spread eight, who spread false information, they have an advantage in what was before the public space. That's a big problem. How can we distinguish? How can we give incentives to spread true information? That's the first question. The second one is that in this new global information communication space, there is a second distortion of competition between despotic regimes on one side and democratic or more open political models. Why? Because the first one, the despotic regimes, they are able to export more easily than ever their contents under control. And of course, they do not import other contents, even if they are produced in more independent ways, they close the doors of their countries. So it creates another unfair competition. And our democracies could die because of this. Clearly, this systemic crisis of the public space is one of the causes one of the most important causes, not the only one, for sure, but one of the most important causes of the crisis of democracy itself. And so that's topics that we have to address. And to address this, we have to consider the causes of the phenomenon, not only the phenomenon. We can speak very long about disinformation, hate speech, propaganda, but it doesn't really help. What helps is not to criticize the people who spread, for instance, hate speech. They existed before. We cannot say that internet changed the human beings, but the system has changed in such a way that today it allows and even incites them to do this, and possibly it could really increase the in-depth um, eight. So we have to analyze the phenomenon to observe the causes to be able then to find the solutions, considering that the Article 19 of the Human Rights Declaration that was established in Paris exactly 70 years ago was perfect about freedom of opinion and expression, but uh, that, of course, its authors couldn't imagine the world of today. And that we have to find, in the same spirit, ways to implement guarantees, democratic guarantees, on freedom of expression and opinion in the now global information and communication space. 
Thank you very much. I think what strikes me about what you said is that uh, I think the people most equipped to offer some solutions are the ones who are being most attacked today. And so that's a key concern and uh, something that we should address in the solutions portion. Amy, if you could please tell us from your perspective and what you do every day, what are the two things that are keeping you awake at night? Well, uh, thank you, Elisa, and thank you, Christophe, for that uh, interesting kind of starting point or framing of the, of the question. Um, I think to, to use my, the few, few minutes I have to kind of talk about my concerns effectively, I'm going to start by giving just a little bit of context in terms of the, the angle or the approach at which we come at the problem. Um, and that's one of a government like many other governments that have been watching the evolution of the information ecosystem um, as part of this general shift to digital technologies. And that's an evolution that has seen major changes in both the production and the consumption of news. Some of those changes are unquestionably positive, including potential for access to a diversity of voices, new avenues for public participation. The increase, and I, I focus here on the increase in the reach and impact of deliberately false, misleading, and infl inflammatory content is also a real part of that shift, and that's been our focus, <laughs> at least where I am. The concern from a government perspective is not, however, just the fact of disinformation, or it's, it's, it's the potential to undermine democratic processes and social cohesion. So it's, it's really when it reaches that level that it's having that real social impact that governments start to become concerned and, and it rightfully shouldn't be concerned before that. Interestingly though, in Canada this is a concern that is shared by Canadians with a large majority expressing concern about the veracity of information online and its impact on democracy and more than half supportive of government action in this area. Uh, and that's really an astounding kind of statistic in Canada. There's been no, there's no tradition of a journalism or media policy. And uh, with very few minor exceptions, there's been little history of government support for journalism. So in terms of an approach, like how, do, how does the government now come at this issue? Um, there's really two lenses that we can bring. The first one is the lens of civic function journalism. Uh, and that's to realize that the rise of these problems has occurred at the time when journalism is in decline. Um, and that's, of course, by no means to uh, diminish the really important work that's being done by journalists and media, or media organizations. But it's just a recognition of the reality that uh, to distribute news on matters of public importance, it costs money. Money. And in Canada, like in many other uh, countries, by historical accident really, part of that production was funded by advertising revenues. There's nothing specific about news that makes it well suited to advertising, but it used to be the vehicle. Print journalism used to be the vehicle to deliver that advertising. And with the digital shift, it's not there anymore. So that, 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 that section of the revenues that was funding journalism is no longer available and there's been nothing to replace it. And without those additional resources, the volume and scope of journalism, professional journalism, is necessarily reduced, as is the capacity of professional journalists to provide a counterbalance to the, the pollution in the information ecosystem. And there is potentially a role for governments here. Um, and we can discuss further later on what that role could be, but it, everything from, from, oh gosh, I'll, I'll come back to it later. So, so the, I'll leave it all. The other kind of, the other lens the government can bring here Sure, sorry. Um, the other lens is, is to focus on the disinformation itself. Um, so that means looking for points of intervention along the entire supply chain, from the source or the author with their different motivations, to the, technical, the characteristics of the content, the technological means used to spread it, the features of the platform, their business models, the curation algorithms, all the way until the citizen that receives and engages with that information. And there's potential points of intervention all along there, but there's also regulatory challenges. Um, and where do those come from? Well, from a public policy perspective, disinformation is not a single problem. It's actually a small part of many other public policy problems. So it's a small part of foreign political interference and manipulation of public discourse. It's a small part of the regulation of AI, a small part of data privacy, a small part of liability for platforms, digital copyrights, social inclusion, cognitive biases, application of law online, discoverability of diverse content, and, and the list goes on. Like this information itself, each one of those problems requires multi-stakeholder international co coordination, 
but it also suffers from a lack of research to support evidence-based public policy making. In Canada, there are still significant gaps about the actual, or gaps in our understanding about the actual overall impact of disinformation, as well as the differential impact on different social groups. So we don't really have the evidence to demonstrate the scope of the problem. And in addition to that gap, of course, there's the omnipresent risks of uh, interference or action of government in, in areas that are so, so closely tied to freedom of expression in the press. Those are the problems, and I'll, I'll come back in a second and talk about potential solutions. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, now we're going to move on to um, our next speaker, who will, from her perspective, from a very different region of the world, tell us about the two key issues that, and the perspective that you're working on, which may be very different, and that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I don't even know where to begin from, because the issues in my region are just too many. So the biggest concern to me from my region, um, I come from sub-Saharan Africa, is censorship. Governments are going to great lengths to censor what journalists do. Um, for example, in Rwanda, they just... Um, uh, enacted a, a legislation where they are banning cartoons. So, like, um, yeah, I know it's cartoons, but um, this means that you know anyone who any content creators uh, online um, or any in audiovisual, print media, whatever it is, they have banned cartoons if they are to, um, if those journalists are talking about um, political entities and um, very heavy penalties uh, will be incurred should you try and um, uh, make this communication or you know present your information in form of cartoons. Uganda on the other hand has very um, I would say crazy laws uh, they, they, uh, that they hide in other legislations and not necessarily uh, legislations here as concerns to journalism. So they currently, you know, um, incarcerated uh, journalists for offensive communication. So they have that um, to try, you know, and control the information that they put out there. Uh, same as Tanzania, it is like a trend in the region. So they uh, they will come and, and um, take away your tools, take away your travel documents. Um, this just happened to two journalists who just uh, went to Tanzania, but then uh, they, even the UN had to intervene uh, for them to be released, and it was a very unfortunate case. So uh, that is the main, main concern, censorship. In Kenya as well, you know, we just had, I'm from Kenya, we just had a computer crimes, uh, a computer misuse and cyber crimes bill, where in it uh, journalists basically have zero, almost zero power, and the government will control basically any information that is put out there. So uh, this is the same case uh, in Ethiopia. You know, Ethiopia is, you know, uh, the queen of, uh, of censorship. They will, uh, I have very many uh, friends from Ethiopia on Facebook. They're even afraid to use their real names. So they use uh, pet names to communicate. Uh, we have a, a point of contact in, in, in Ethiopia. And anytime there's, you know, a looming internet shutdown, they communicate with us and they're like, oh, no, yeah, yeah you know, I can't do this right now because, uh, uh, because, you know, it will put her in danger. So I would say, uh, Censorship through legislation and hiding small pieces of legislation in, in, um, in uh, legislations that don't pertain, you know, the tech policy arena, for, like in Kenya right now, uh, they have done it in form of a tax. They introduce, we have a new finance tax law, and they, uh, we have a tax where, you know, if you are uh, putting any information out there, if you are, uh, as a journalist, if it's uh, information meant for the public, you have to pay a certain amount of tax. This is the same case in Uganda. And in Tanzania, uh, online, any online communication media has to pay 900 US dollars to be able to put that information out there. So legislation is uh, uh, the big tool that you know, governments are using to censor what is put out there by journalists. Um, another big concern, you know, is how women are treated in my region, women um, in this arena, how they are treated in my region. Um, women are hated by the people in the same profession. So 
you get a lot of bullying happening. They are called, uh, they call them, uh, there's a term that they use um, uh, in the region, they say, you know, uh, they call you a slay queen bimbo if you're a woman in especially uh, visual media because they're like, oh yeah, they tell you how to dress. You shouldn't dress like that. Uh, we don't want you to read for us the news. We don't want you to uh, write these articles. What do you know? They don't even, you know, trust the information that's coming out of you. So that is, um, those are the two major concerns, I would say. And um, I don't know, am I allowed to give solutions or later? Okay, okay. So those uh, would be uh, the key problems in my region at least. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, we're, we're looking at the government as a potential source of a solution and as a key source of the problem as well, which makes things very tricky. And then we're moving from uh, this very uh, clear line of attack and, and hate and aggression online that very easily moves on to the physical space. And I think our next speaker can speak to both of those issues. Um, so Swati, please tell us about your key concerns and what you've recently experienced. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for hearing me as well. I'm going to stick to the time limit because you told us to do that. In my country, I and most uh, women journalists get Rape, rape threats and death threats every day, around a dozen. We are called secular prostitutes. Our numbers are shared on WhatsApp. It's a kind of a blood sport to attack us, to put out our details, to dox us. And unfortunately, the reason I did my investigative book, I'm a troll, is because I couldn't deal with all this hate. And I, as an investigative journalist, the only tool I had was to find out who was behind it. Much to my horror and shock, I found out that all this hate is pretty much organized. And the bigger question here was that the party in power was doing <coughs> this. So India is the world's largest democracy. All of us take humongous pride in this. But having said that, in how, what kind of democracy are we when people are attacked for having a view, which differs from the government or the party in power? Um, one thing that Donald Trump and Mr. Modi have in common, that's my prime minister, that they don't like the media. I mean, I just want to say we are not enemies of the people. We are all doing our job. I recently got an award for courage, and to me that is the most uh, sad thing, that for doing our job, we are given awards for courage now, because in, in my country last year, a very senior journalist was shot dead in front of our house, and some people that my investigation revealed that Mr. Modi follows on Twitter, some handles, actually rejoiced and said that, you know, a bitch has died and her puppies are crying. There was an international outcry, and yet he did not unfollow a single one of those handles. So to me, right now, the government is taking away the merit respectability of a fourth estate in a democracy, and that is, has frightening consequences. Our prime minister, the first prime minister in India's history, who's never ever held a press conference. They want less scrutiny. They want to take away the merit respectability of the media. And to me, this is a concern across the world. If the US president says that the media is the enemy of the people, I mean, what could be sadder in the US, you know? I'm all for freedom of expression, but why, is, why are governments attacking <coughs> the media and citizens who have a differing view? Thank you. That is uh, such a stark description of the kinds of things that uh, Reporters Without Borders, the International Women's Media Foundation, and the Committee to Protect Journalists, who recently had two of its workers imprisoned in Tanzania, have been fighting for 30 years. And I think what we see is that the tools are differing and so our response also has to differ. And so what do you do when the press is being attacked from all sides and when those attacks are causing people, especially people of diverse backgrounds, people from underrepresented communities, to leave the news media in great numbers, leaving only those who are supported by major news organizations to be able to withstand uh, these kinds of sustained attacks. So, uh, Christophe, if we could get from you just sort of a meta view of, of what uh, your position is and how RSF is approaching this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. First, of course, and that's what we do on a daily basis, we have to help the people who are victims of all those behaviors. And we do this through advocacy, through capacity building actions, material assistance, legal support, etc. Because if we do not do this, 
it will really improve self-censorship and it will discourage those who would like to take risks to investigate or report. But we do believe that if we just do this, if we would just do this, we would cure symptoms, very violent sim symptoms sometimes, but that we have to work on the causes and address the causes and find ways to really change the game. To change the game, we have launched recently two, according to us, um, major initiatives, a macro and a micro, as economists would say. The macro one, as I said, the national, the, the, sorry, in the history of democracies, and we need democracies to resist despotic regimes, so we need to empower democracies, we need to mobilize them. So as I said, in the history of democracies, the guarantees, the democratic guarantees for information and freedom of opinion were established through regulation or self-regulation on a national basis. But it doesn't work, work anymore in a global space. So how do we create guarantees in a global space? For this, we've created an independent commission on information and democracy composed of 25 public figures from 18 nationalities. Nobel laureates, Josef Stiglitz, Amartya Sen, Shirin Ebadi, Nobel Peace Laureate, Mario Vargas Llosa, but also human rights defenders, Owa Ibrahim, uh, Sakharov Prize Laureate, specialists of new technologies from different countries, and journalists who have to face authoritarian strongmen in Russia, in the Philippines, in Turkey, etc. And together, we've written a declaration on information and democracy. You could say, oh, that's, we have such a long list of such declarations. We consider that we entered a new logic. And the new logic is that what happened recently is that the governments delegated the organization of the public space itself to platforms. They have said to platforms, or, or no, not they, we as consumers have, say, have said to platforms, oh, take the square of the village and you can put the chairs, the tables, where you want, and you decide who sits where. So we have delegated this without expressing our, uh, this space, without expressing ourselves as citizens, without saying, okay, we can delegate this, but under certain conditions. And those conditions are just the principles of democracy and of the defense of uh, trustworthiness of, of information, for instance. And so this is the principle of this declaration that is, I think, quite original. And this declaration was published exactly one week and one day ago. So please have a look on it on our website or another website. And last, two days ago, um, on, on Sunday, no, sorry, three, three days ago, a few leaders from all the continents, heads of government and states, have launched a political process on the basis of this declaration. We had uh, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, Emmanuel Macron, the French President, but we also had the Presidents of Costa Rica, Tunisia, Prime Minister of Norway, etc. Twelve heads of state and government published a common a press release on Sunday saying that they commit to build those guarantees, taking the vision and the principles 
of this declaration. And now we will have to move, to move, on, to move forward and to move forward quickly. But we have, I would say, imposed the vision and uh, you could have a look uh, in your newspapers, in, in a lot of newspapers in, in the international press this morning, there was a call by those heads of government and states um, in many countries um, to mobilize beyond the first circle. But we considered that we had to start with a small number of countries, but on a strong position, avoiding just to have a consensus between all the countries. We do believe that we have to, to be uh, pushy on a, on a strong position. So that's the macro solution. Then, and I will try to be shorter, um, the uh, micro solution. When you say in the principles, and that's just a principle among others, that platforms have to give advantages, uh, uh, have to incite uh, trustworthiness of information. How do you proceed? We need a market solution. We need a concrete solution to help distinguish the good from the bad. When I say the good from the bad, I mean the contents or the media outlets that are closer to the ideals of journalism, verification, ethics, transparency, independence, than the other media outlets are, that are really far away from this. And we started with a European solution to avoid too many trolls from countries where the vision about journalism is really different. But in fact, uh, it's a global initiative. We have a lot of stakeholders from everywhere. Um, and just in a few words, the principle is we start with standardization, like an ISO process, considering that journalism is a process and that standardization is about setting up guarantees for processes that's really neutral regarding the conception of journalism, just the minimal guarantees that define journalism. Then it helps, it will help to establish whitelists through certification. And then we can request from different stakeholders to give incentives. First, platforms, an incentive for indexation, ranking, Second, and ad incentives with advertisers, and a lot of them agree on this principle, possibly uh, regulatory bodies, etc. And uh, we have a lot of stakeholders, dozens of media outlets, um, press councils, unions, regulatory bodies, etc., with different roles, of course. Only journalistic stakeholders establish the norms, the standards. And we are deeply convinced that it is really a solution because fact-checking, unfortunately, uh, that's a wonderful uh, way to exercise journalism, but we know that every day 100 million contents are published on the internet, and the total capacity, the global capacity of newsrooms regarding fact-checking is just a few thousand articles. So what we've established is a trusted third party mechanisms, mechanism that helps to avoid that both governments or platforms make decisions about what media outlets, which media outlets should be, um, um, should get advantages. That's purely on principles, but that's also in the same time a very concrete mechanism that can function. And I have to say that Facebook has registered, Google, um, Twitter, and others do participate in, in this work. Um, and we, on the other side, have uh, BBC, uh, Guardian, uh, European media outlets everywhere, uh, Poland, Germany, France, etc. And, and um, surprisingly, for this European initiative, and it will be my last word, the country where we have the biggest number of registered companies or stakeholders is the U.S. Thank you. The, the oh. name of this initiative, so, sorry, yeah. is uh, Journalism Trust Initiative, if you want to <laughs> Google that. Great, thank you. I hope that uh, when we come back to you, we can talk a little bit about how 
the initiative deals with the increasing nature of independent journalists and freelancers and what they're, how they're going to be represented among these uh, platforms and how they would be certified um, and just to make sure that they're not the last ones on the list. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Amy, if you could talk about solutions from your perspective for just a couple minutes too, thank you. Sure, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's interesting that I'm kind of sitting between kind of two different perspectives, so I, I, I think that that actually is to, is to be and should be reflected in the, in the way that governments approach this issue, that they can't only look internally at their situation and the state of their democracy, but understand that these things cross borders um, and the actions of one government can certainly motivate actions in different ways from other governments. So um, that, I think that needs to be always present in the considerations. As we said, that the, the issues, those basic human rights issues of freedom of speech and freedom of the press need to be omnipresent as we do explore solutions. Um, and it's in that context that I'm gonna suggest two areas of potentially immediate action that governments can consider. Um, and the first one relates to the challenge that I talked about in this lack of evidence, this lack of evidence base upon which to, to build public policy. Um, and that's something that can be addressed immediately. And, that, and that's, that is the role of government to help support investments in research and build those research networks. So that research and those investments should be coming quickly and, and as quickly as possible, really, so that we have that evidence base that's required. It's not enough, though, just to invest in the research. There's also issues of data that um, if research don't, researchers don't have access to, they may not be able to come up with the solutions and the understandings of the problem that we need. Um, so there's also a role for government, either through legislative regulatory measures or through kind of voluntary agreements to provide, to ensure that those researchers have access to the data from the intermediaries required to properly study the impact of the problem. So that that whole area of kind of helping further research with the access to the data is, a, I think, an important one and one the government should be working on right away and, and could cooperate with each other on. Um, the, second, uh, the second one, um, and this, uh, this one has been discussed a lot at this conference, so I'd, I certainly don't want to discuss it more except maybe to add just a, a few qualifications, and that's the idea of supporting digital uh, media or civic literacy um, or education. Um, so this is a relatively low risk area of intervention for governments because these are skills that people need anyways and if it, doesn't, if it doesn't do anything about this information, well at least people will be more media literate, how could that be a bad thing? So there's, there's good reason why uh, people put this forward as a, as a potential solution. Um, we don't know yet though, because of this research gap, we don't know to what degree disinformation is actually responsive to media education. So will media education reduce the spread of this? Will it have an effect on, on the negative social impacts? We don't know that yet, um, but that's not a reason not to do it. Um, it's, just, it's just a reason to continue to study and readjust and readjust those programs and make sure they're launched in kind of dynamic ways that allow you to cater them to the information as it becomes available and to make sure to, to launch them in a, in a rigorous way that you're actually collecting data and, and, and making those adjustments. Combined with that is the issue of, and, and it's, I think it's a looming issue of, is it really possible for somebody, and here we're not talking necessarily about the children or the teenagers that are sometimes the focus of these activities, but even for adults like ourselves, if we were honest with ourselves, we would say, well, you know, sometimes I do get caught uh, believing something that I shouldn't or engaging with a piece of content online, not, not completely understanding the source. And the people in this room are generally highly educated, very worldly people. So if, if, even for us, there's difficulties and navigating that information ecosystem. How realistic is it that we, through media education campaigns, are really going to be able to help guide people through the system? Um, we don't know the answer to that, but one, of, one part of that answer might be for governments not only to be looking at education, but also at tools. So uh, there's a lot of different kind of uh, innovative uh, enterprises all over the world that are looking at providing tools to help navigate the information ecosystem and there may be a role for government to support those things or to incorporate them into media education. Um, the initiative that Christophe was talking about actually could be a very good feeder for those tools. I mean he presented it from an economic perspective about aligning the incentives um, but those types of internationally agreed upon initiatives and, and rating systems could be used to fuel tools used in the education process and for children as they learn how to navigate the information ecosystem. So there's a lot of synergies to be had between the different solutions um, and there's a role for government to help encourage that in, in the using the different levers that they have. Uh, 
those are my two ideas for now. Um, I, I'll just say that going back to what I said at the beginning, which is part of the problem is the decline or the financial gap for journalism, there's also areas of intervention for government there, but I'm, I'm not going to raise them at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Watagi, if you could, from your perspective. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you. Um, I like that Amy said, you know, actions of one government could definitely, you know, influence the actions of another government because that is exactly what is happening right now in Africa. Um, Tanzania, you know, started us off by, you know, introducing the, you know, the OTT, the internet tax, um, uh, you know, to censor their bloggers and um, other journalists. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, Uganda did it, then Kenya did it, then Zambia did it, um, and right now, Rwanda is, uh, wants to do it. So we have seen it happening. So, the, uh, so with that said, I think my two best you know, solutions that I have uh, right now are, one, strategic uh, litigation. Um, of course, you know, this requires resources and requires you know, a lot of patience and you know, it's time consuming and you know, it requires a lot of research. So um, we realize uh, by the time you know, these uh, legislations and laws are being passed, they, come, they don't come from people you know, who are from a position of knowledge. They just sit down and pass um, these laws. Like we had the South Africa Digital uh, Rights Workshop the other day and we invited uh, uh, lawmakers, media, and uh, you know, it was the whole multi-stakeholder uh, thing. And, um, we realize they are not informed. They don't even know anything about, you know, what is digital rights? Why do we need, you know, to have this kind of um, regulation? So uh, we find ourselves, you know, we are going to fight when, you know, it has already been passed, the act has been passed by people who are not, you know, uh, informed. So with strategic litigation, you have to start while, you know, that legislation is at its infancy and instead of like, you know, waiting for it to be an act and then there's a whole uproar. So, and then um, the other point I have, you know, is, uh, you know, increasing our advocacy efforts. So um, I, I think there is a large, you know, civil society in Africa that um, has not been tapped into. So we need to, you know, um, you know, work with other civil society organizations and, you know, when, you know, invitations of collaboration are put out there, it is important that, you know, we respond and accept and go to collaborate because they think uh, when we ask someone, you know, let's collaborate, it's because we know you bring something to the table and we, we, we want you to, you know, to help us with it. Of course, you know, advocacy as well will require a lot of um, uh, resources, uh, but it has worked. Uh, I have seen it work. In Kenya, you know, the Computer, Cyber, Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act, you know, we followed the entire, you know, litigation process and we are still in court. Um, and we have had, you know, right now some of the sections be, have been declared unconstitutional. So it does work, but it requires a lot of patience. Uh, so, you know, definitely in, uh, in Uganda now, you know, we are trying to have that uh, section from the act that uh, provides for offensive communication. We are trying to, you know, to to ensure that uh, you know it is struck out because it limits a lot of freedom, freedom of expression. Uh, there's just so many things that it does. So we want to uh, ensure that you know uh, lawmakers stop hiding, you know, small sections of uh, legislation in legislations that don't even um, uh, don't relate to you know what is the entire bill should be about. And um, in terms of advocacy. Um, education is important. So we need to ensure everybody is in the room. We will not, um, we, we need to ensure everyone is in the room. We need to ensure the multi-stakeholder, uh, you know, approach, you know, is upheld because when everyone, when everyone is talking, uh, when this, uh, they will be able to understand then why are we doing this? This is why we shouldn't pass this, uh, legislation. So we saw it um, happening in Nigeria. So we ensured everyone was in the room. We actually even invited, you know, police officers to come to the room. And he was really fighting us. He was like, you know, why, why do I need to do this? Why do they need to talk and, you know, say anything they want to say? And, you know, he was really complaining and fighting us, but we realized eventually what he really wanted to do was understand. And 
uh, two months, I mean, six months later, he was appointed to be, you know, the chief um, uh, uh, in charge of digital, uh, the digital space in a region in Nigeria. And the first uh, thing that he passed was like, you know, uh, you know, my, myself as a police officer, as, uh, you know, as an officer in charge of this department, I promise to ensure that in this region, digital rights are upheld and, you know, everyone that is uh, in this space is protected and we will ensure that um, we drive this message. So we are like, you know, what people really want is to have the conversation and they want to understand, so they don't know. So that is, you know, one of the things we need to do uh, while we do our advocacy. So thank you. Congratulations, that's a, a great result of your work and, and proof that engagement often does work. Uh, Swati, I wonder, I mean, you lived a, a pretty horrible experience and you're probably still living it now, and I wonder what has been most helpful to you as a journalist, as a woman, and also um, what you see are sort of the, the more um, high-level inter interventions that have been helpful to you or that could have been helpful to you in your own experience? That's actually a good question because the only thing that was helpful for m to me were my investigative journalism skills. Nobody helped. And unlike the rest of this very distinguished panel, I'm extremely pessimistic. I totally support Christoph's great initiative, but what do you do when the government decides to disseminate fake news on an industrial scale? When a government interferes in another country's elections, you know, when a when a whole Twitter army is is created just to ensure a certain amount of certain different kind of a election result, those are the real issues I think we need to engage with because everything else sounds very utopian. I don't think, you know, five people chatting in a room is going to solve anything because what's happened is with social media, governments have realized that you know they can actually play mind games. There's an echo chamber to which they cater to. And as we saw in the case of Russia and the U.S. elections, where we still don't know the extent of what really happened. In my own country, elections are due this year, and I know for a fact that the stuff that people cannot say in print or they cannot put out on television is all being put on social media, is all being put on phones with their WhatsApp. So, you know, I really don't see any solution till we have people respecting things like freedom of expression because propaganda is a way to gain political power, at least in India, and I really honestly don't see any solutions for that. Well, then maybe it's a good time to open it up to audience and maybe they have some solutions for us because that was very disheartening, although I don't disagree entirely and I do think that there's room for a lot of other players. So uh, let's have a conversation on either side of the discussion. So your hand went up first. If you could introduce yourself, if you don't mind. And okay, yeah, happy to. Uh, my name is Hans Klein. I'm from Georgia Tech. And um, I admire journalists. But it's, it's great, but what I'm going to say is perhaps a little critical of journalists and the role that, that they play. You've, you, I like you, the speaker from India, you've made important points asking the question, is, is, is journalism, the, is the media the enemy of the people, is the propaganda out there? I live in the United States, and it's my perception that the media and the journalists working for the media play a very important propaganda role in American society, particularly in U.S. foreign policy. So when the United States invaded Iraq, the media was mobilized the public, there was a real joy and support for going to war, doing the right thing. When we engaged in regime change in Libya, it was a responsibility to protect, it was a humanitarian enterprise. Uh, the destruction of Syria, uh, freedom fighters there on the ground, terrific, good stuff. Uh, the place where I was able to find alternative narratives and alternative facts was uh, in what's often branded the fake news. Alternative um, sources, uh, people like Seymour Hirsch, who was a pretty famous journalist. He broke the Milai massacre, he broke the Abu Ghraib, and is now no longer really a journalist anymore because he was expelled from the profession and from the, from the media outlets. Others, Gary Webb, who broke the CIA role in cocaine trade, uh, Robert Perry, who broke the Iran Contra story. story. These were, in, to my mind, these are the great journalists, and yet they're they're no longer in the profession. They're excluded from the institutions. So I wonder, if, uh, if, it's, if it wouldn't be important for when we speak about journalism to really ask some tough questions of journalism or at least the large media corporations, the large corporations that provide us with journalism and the role they do as, as propaganda, as legitimating the state, et cetera, et cetera. I 
think part of what you're getting at is the consolidation of news ownership as well, which really contributes to this problem. Um, and I think it's important to, uh, in the world that we live in today, to distinguish the work of the individual journalists with the result of the media enterprise and also caution against using alternative news, which has been co-opted uh, to be a really bad thing in terms of alternative facts to independent news and those independent journalists who were fighting the wave of, of the mainstream. Um, and McClatchy, which is one of the bigger papers, was also on uh, the other side of those um, sort of mainstream facts. But I do want to make sure that anybody on the panel has an opportunity to respond to the, the, the critical role and um, the professionalism of journalists and the need to make sure that uh, the public understands what that role is. I think what you also meant was embedded journal journalism, which is when, you know, when something, you know, you kind of accompany the army and do, which has happened a lot in the U.S. But having said that, I don't, I think the U.S. media at the current moment is doing an absolutely brilliant job. So, you know, I don't think we should be pessimistic about, at least right now, the U.S. media. So, so it's doing a great job. The whole weapons of mass destruction, all, all that no, kind of stuff, no. Syria, Libya, blah, blah, no, no. blah. I wasn't great talking job. about that. I was talking about at the current moment, because what you're talking about is actually embedded journalism, which I completely think is wrong. I don't think that should actually happen. Yeah, um, I appreciate your question, and I also admire Seymour Hersh. Uh, for sure, we shouldn't consider that journalists by definition are doing a great job. It would be totally stupid. There are corrupted journalists, there are biased journalists, there are factors like media ownership, but also sometimes just that journalists believe the closest sources on their national sources. So for sure, um, journalism sometimes can be exercised in such a way that that's not appropriate. But the question today for our societies is how can we have the best guarantees, and they were never perfect for sure, to, so that human beings can exercise their right to, to trustworthy information. Because they d if they do not get trustworthy inf news and information, their rights biological rights or political economic rights will be violated. So how do we proceed? And the question is, how can we secure, not only for journalism, also for scientific information or in all the fields, in fact, of information, how do we secure or at least promote trustworthy information? And um, journalism as a role to play, and we have to create the conditions so that the journalists, the academics, whatever this, this is the domain, are um, in, in incentivized to be um, as close as possible to the ideals. Use the rational method, methods, uh, listen to different voices, um, and, and um, and really try to get um, the truth from different point of views. And that's a question I think that you can criticize very deeply the media outlets or be an admirer of media outlets. In, in the two cases, I think all the people can agree that it's better to have independent information than an independent, to have information that is verified that, um, instead of not verified, etc., and, and we, we have to start from there, and then journalism, but journalism is not the only institution uh, that has to play a role, of course, but it has to play a role. For this, we have to, to defend journalists, but also having in mind that, that we have to, 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 to not, not to consider that whatever they do, that's perfect, but really to have ideals in mind. Hi, my name is Emin Hussainov. I'm from Azerbaijan, but temporarily living in exile in Switzerland. 
I'm a journalist and also a human rights activist. Uh, my question is to Secretary General of uh, Reporters Without Borders. How do you talking about truth, but what do you think how to make better role of UNESCO? Because today we are here in Paris, in IGF, and now UNESCO have a new leadership. But from my perspective, since new Director General appointed her, her positions, nothing move on on prevention of the crime against the journalists. Yes, UNESCO always react if journalists kill because they say for Unfortunately, we are only able to react when journalists murdered. But why UNESCO not reacted before the journalists uh, murdered or jailed or don't make his job better? Why, what do you think about perspective to make a wild um, mandate from UNESCO, start to make this initiative? Because why I'm talking about this, previous uh, director uh, general with relation with Azerbaijan have some kind of uh, stories which is written in the media, it's many stories with uh, unfairness regarding the Azerbaijan because she is very best friend of wife of our dictator Ilham Aliyev. His wife also goodwill ambassador of UNESCO still until today, even with dozens of times together RSF called to uh, stop her mandate for goodwill ambassador because it's shame for UNESCO to have a goodwill ambassador like her because it's reason why the journalists uh, detain it or jail it like Khadija Ismailova. Today we have Sevin Josmang as a very brave exile-based journalist. She's based in DC. But Azerbaijani uh, propaganda machine started blaming her for the last three weeks and told her we need to took her to the box and bring back to Azerbaijan. How do you think for ab we able to make some kind of joint efforts and to t tell to UNESCO guys it's time to make actions to stop this honeymoon for these dictators to using these important institutions. And for next year, they want to organize a cultural heritage annual meeting in Azerbaijan. When UNESCO is able to start and when this is important to make this action? Thanks. Th th thank you for this very important question. I, I do not represent UNESCO at all. But uh, uh, first, I, you, you spoke about the new leadership, and that's really important. I, I have to say that. Uh, the new Director General of UNESCO, Audra Zoulet, uh, supported uh, the launch of our initiative last uh, Sunday. Um, so did also the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and the head of Council of Europe. And uh, it's very important that even heads of international organizations support such um, initiatives, even if that's not easy, probably, when you run such an institution with so many different countries and political regimes. Second, you know that regarding journalist safety, a lot of resolutions have been adopted by various UN bodies. The UN Security Council in 2006 and 2015, uh, the Council on Huma, um, Human Rights, uh, the General Assembly, and UNESCO. A UNESCO plan in fact, a UN plan, but run by the UNESCO, has been launched in 2012 on the question of um, uh, journalism, journalism safety. It's very difficult to get results on the field because of the fact that it's difficult to influence regimes, such as the one in, in Azerbaijan, and also because today the level of impunity is so high 90% in 90% of the cases of crimes against journalists, there is no condemnation and no sentence. So that's why uh, we at Reporters Without Borders, RSF, have launched um, in 2015 a campaign so that the UN adopts a concrete, creates a concrete mechanism for the compliance, um, for the implementation of the international law. And we do consider uh, and we um, advocate for this that a special representative should be appointed to the Secretary General of the UN as a question of protection of journalists. And um, Mrs. Azoulay's predecessor supported this idea. Um, Audra Azoulay uh, supported this idea. We do believe that we really need this so that governments, member states, have to face their obligations that are set up by the international law. That's really an emergency because we have to notice this year, for instance, 
that the number of crimes, of murders of journalists in, in the course of doing their jobs is much higher than last year. And in fact, we could believe that the different topics that we spoke about today, the structure of the space and the life of journalists, that's two different topics. But in fact, when journalists are living in a public sphere and where, when they are weakened, there's a lack of resistance. And guys who wouldn't have acted against them decide then to act. And even on the European soil, investigative journalists were killed within a few months. And Europe remains the best continent for press freedom. But that's really a very bad sign. And that's a sign that all the speeches that we hear by various politicians, not only criticizing, that's perfectly legitimate, but calling to hate about journalists, they have consequences. Yeah, I, th I think that's so true. And I think that we can no longer uh, distinguish that line between the hate that's happening online and the hate that's happening on the ground. And so we're closing out, but there are a couple of other hands. We'll just do two more. So if you want to go ahead and let's keep it brief so that we can get sure. just one. Hi, I'm Julie Pizzetti from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate you and encourage you. Um, these are topics that have been discussed um, by myself and many others um, for several years now, and it's only just now that I really feel that we're integrating our approaches and discussions and starting to talk about practical modes to respond. I just wanted to draw people's attention to this book that was launched yesterday called Journalism, um, Fake News and Disinformation, which has a range of practical approaches, um, skills development and resources, um, particularly going to the issue of um, gendered online harassment, um, which we now know is being used as a tool um, to suppress uh, journalism. And there's case studies from, from India um, and Africa um, as well. So to draw your attention to that, it's free online. And I have a question. Um, I've had, a, had debates recently with groups of um, highly influential journalists, some of whom want to continue to argue that this is not a time for journalism activism um, and for journalists to be reporting on these problems and describing these problems because it feeds community perceptions of bias and self-interest um, and, and that goes to polarisation. So there still seems to be a resistance, as we see with reporting on journalism safety, um, to addressing these issues. And, and to me, this is a misconstrued. So I'm interested in, in your responses to that. I know, uh, you know a couple of you and many others have re used investigative journalism very effectively to expose these issues. But what would you say in response to that as, as other journalists frame it? Swati, why don't we uh, hear from you? How, how effective uh, has your uh, re using your skills to report on what has happened to you and what is the possible backlash of using journalism um, it, for that cause? Well, the worst sort of censorship for doing my kind of journalism would be death, you know. That's a very harsh kind of censorship, but that's also happened. I have faced a lot of threats. In fact, recently, um, a very, very senior police officer actually told me that please start jumping traffic lights at night. Don't stop because you can actually get murdered. Having said that, I don't think journalism, journalists are asking for any special privileges. We just want to, again and again, I'm saying this, we just want to be allowed to do our job. That is being taken away from us, and that, I think, is truly the actual problem here. Okay, uh, can we, you right there, please. Thanks. I have a question for the Secretary General for Reporters Well Borders. I was taking a look at this declaration that you, you just told us about. Um, it says here that one of these principles that you're promoting is that those who produce, spread, and help spread information should be responsible and also says that that they I'm speaking about social networks mainly and like these platforms and that they should implement mechanisms to I'm translating back from Spanish um, to favor truthful information. So I was wondering what's the role that you think these platforms should have? In fact, there are, there are different theories. Some people consider that the platforms are just media outlets. They spread contents. 
And so they should be considered as like publishers. Zuckerberg is the head of Facebook, he's like an editor in chief, he enjoys his freedom of expression, and he does what he wants with his algorithm. That's a conception. We do believe that this conception is dangerous because it would be a way to say that if Zuckerberg wants his algorithm to have a bias, that is freedom to do this. And it would be true for Zuckerberg, it would be true for Chinese platforms that are just aligned with the Communist Party in China. So we do believe, and that's an in-depth um, principle of, of, of this declaration, that the platforms today, they are in fact entities that create the norms, the architectures of choices and the means of the information and communication space. They create the structure. They do what our governments did before. The laws of our government were sometimes good, sometimes bad, but we could check it. We knew the laws. With the exception of despotic regimes and religious states, the public space was neutral. Today, you do not have a guarantee on this. So that's why um, we, we have to change the logic of regulation. We have to change the logic, the way government see this information field, considering that when you create the field itself, when you structure it, you have special responsibilities that are not the responsibilities of platforms according to uh, freedom of expression, uh, to, to, of publishers according to freedom of, of expression. That's something else. But you say that they should be neutral, but also they should favor truthful no, content? No, it depends. Uh, that's a good question. It depends on which neutrality. We do consider that it should be politically neutral, uh, ideologically neutral, neutral toward their own services. I mean, not um, have different um, factors or, or uh, criteria when it's about their own interest. But of course we do not consider that they should be neutral about the question uh, of uh, trustworthiness of information. On this, no, we do not want neutrality. Is this clear? But I'm open to, to continue no, the talk, clear, but, but I, I do not want to. <laughs> it is clear, but I'm wondering like, there is a concern that I'm sure you are very well aware of, of they, they, like they making these decisions of what's truthful, what should go there, what should be left out. So that's, that's, I think it's an issue that it's not solved and I was wondering where you guys were drawing that line. No, we do not want them to make the decisions, we want them to set up mechanisms that avoid that they have to make the decisions. Okay. Okay, one more quick question. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Luisa. I am a Brazilian student. I'm here with the Youth at IGF program, which is funded by the Managing Committee of Internet in Brazil. And in my point of view, the problem with legal and state-led guarantees is that it's developed by the logic of democratic countries in the mentality that the state is a service provider for citizens. However, in a lot of a lot of us here live in countries that have authoritarian governments or have a history of authoritarianism, as is the case of Brazil. And it really means that a lot of the time the government is the enemy of the people. And in that logic, and considering what has been said in the panel, that uh, legislation made in one country influences legislation made in other countries, do you believe that there is any way the civil society can act that is not related to the state at all so that we can make guarantees for journalists to work or is there any way that democratic and first world countries can provide legislation that does not interfere negatively in this global problem? Thank you. No, that's, uh, that, that's um, a, a pure question. In fact, 
despotic regimes, they create the norms. And they, everybody complies with it. So uh, we have to create other norms, complying with principles of freedom to oppose the first ones. If you just accept that despotic regimes say, we impose our view and that this democratic models do, does not impose another view, they will be weakened. So what we spoke about, and that's really interesting that you asked this question, is that we could consider, oh, that's just for democracies, but the rest of the world, do you consider them? But in fact, if we want to resist, to oppose despotic regimes, we have to mobilize. We have to create another vision. We have to develop it. We have to create the means. And in fact, uh, you could say yes, but if you accept the principle of norms in this country, other ones will use it. But they, in any case, they will use it. So it's better to impose your own vision. That's a way, really, the initiatives I spoke about are for democracies, but are a way to exercise the biggest possible pressure on despotic regimes. And I think, in fact, Brazil is a great example of mobilizing. Some of the most interesting campaigns have come out of Brazil. The Let Us Work campaign, led by women sports reporters in Brazil, uh, was hugely successful. And I think there, there have been others. So the history of mobilization is huge. And I think also, in terms of the public sphere, um, I think we have seen um, democratic countries uh, at least expressing their displeasure at companies who bow to the will of despotic regimes, like we saw with Google in China and other companies that willingly um, go along with rules that we would not accept for ourselves. Um, so I think that we play a, a big role in helping to oppose those despotic regimes as well. I think we are closing up. I know we just scratched the surface, as always happens with these discussions, because there are so many angles. But I think um, from, from the perspective of the International Women's Media Foundation and uh, on behalf of journalists, I encourage you to support journalists and journalism as much as you can, to keep in mind that it's important to have a diversity of news sources, uh, whether they be uh, independent or mainstream, that and, and also a diversity of reporters reporting the news. And so do all you can to support journalism. Without it, we are going to be in a lot of trouble. Thank you very much to our panel for your intervention. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming.